Hello, I'm Amanda B. Johnson, and you're watching Dash Detailed, friend. A couple episodes back, my manservant Pete solicited questions from you, the audience, that you wanted to ask ABJ, me. You responded, and here I am to answer them. All right, lay them on me. Okay, so Mauricio G. asks, Trading doesn't seem appealing since I'm not a professional day trader. How can I invest and earn money with Dash and help its market cap grow? Well, I mean, if a person doesn't want to trade, I don't want to trade really either. I tried that for a bit, and after losing enough money, I've just it's just not for me because um, maybe like you, I don't I don't play the short game either because the short game seems pretty much about like pump and dumps, right? Like if you know what's going to get pumped and when. You can sell the top and, you know, you're done. But a lot of that, um, it, it also is, stuff like that isn't going to help with, like, digital currency adoption in the long run either, right? And so, like you, I'm also wholly uninterested in that. Um, so, I mean, of course, the simplest way, if you want to invest in Dash, the simplest, easiest way uh, is, of course, just to buy Dash. Um, some people who don't currently have like a thousand dash but still want to earn master node payouts or at least a portion of them are participating in what's called like trusted master node shares um there are several providers of this uh, i'll put them in the description below where if you have say like 25 dash or 50 dash you know they'll hold on to it combine it with the dash of many other people and then send y'all part of the master node payout that they host for you um, so it's a temporary trusted solution that you can try until trustless decentralized masternode shares come along in Dash's future. Um, and so there's that, or of course there's always like mining, right? Um, I, th I mean, a mining machine, a mining ASIC in Dash right now, you could maybe get a used one for like $2,000 or less, you know, if, if that's something that you're interested in. Or there's also, um, if you don't want to buy a machine of your own, there's cloud mining. And I hear, I hear the best reputation is like Genesis mining. They haven't screwed anybody over so far that I've heard. So I would say those would be your three options. Um, well, of course, hold Dash, buy a share, uh, look into getting your own mining machine and or cloud mining. Okay, so, um, next, Ben N asks, what is the thought process behind the Four Cities tour? What do you hope to accomplish? Oh, geez. Well, that's not even a question for me. I mean, Pete was the one who organized the tour. Um, I, of course, am happy to speak anywhere that I'm invited, anywhere where that would be of interest to someone. Um, but I'm not a logistics person. I'm not, I'm not even so much of an outreach person. I'm actually kind of antisocial off camera. Um, but Pete, which you may not know, um, is the co-founder of CopBlock, which is the world's largest police accountability organization. And so this is like his bag, like doing outreach and um, networking and bringing people together in like meetups and things and spreading ideas sort of like in a grassroots manner is very much his thing. And so we were just going on a road trip anyway to see some family for Thanksgiving. And Pete was just like, oh, how about we see if anyone wants to meet up with us and, like, talk about Dash. And so that's where that came from. Okay, right on. And Ben and also asks, 50 or 100 years in the future, if Dash and Bitcoin are the reserve currencies and have reached moon status, what will the, will the world look like? What changes? Well, I think... I think it's pretty implausible that both Dash and Bitcoin would be seen as reserve currencies because Dash is just like what Bitcoin was supposed to be, what Bitcoin should be. And it's so incredibly superior that if someone were using Dash, if it had like reserve currency status, there would be like no reason for them to use Bitcoin whatsoever because it offers like zero benefits over Dash. So I'm going to uh, rephrase your question to in 50 or 100 years, what would the world look like if, like, Dash were the reserve currency? Um, I don't think it would actually look very different. And this is maybe where my opinion differs from some people in that I don't think that 
tools and technology like change human nature. I think that humans pretty much remain the same and while they may be using things as different from, you know, you know, like the printing press didn't change human nature. The automobile didn't change human nature. Uh, before that, like the like trains, like the locomotive and you know, steam power, none of that really changed human nature. And so I think that, you know, while things could be so different as to, you know, oh, we're using this like decentralized internet money. Wow, wow, wow. That's kind of new in history. I don't think that people will be different. So you can look at that in one of two ways. You can think like, oh, like that's a bummer. You know, I, I wanted everything to be different in the future. Or you can look at it as like how I look at it as like a, like a nice sort of almost comforting thing, which is that um, we, c we can change our surroundings, but we're not going to radically change people. And I think that I think that that can be a good thing because we're so prone to error that if we could actually like change all of humanity, like just based on like one of our little errors, I think that would be exceptionally frightening. So. OK, good answer. Uh, Jason H asks, could you recount your metamorphosis from the daily decrypt to dash detailed? Oh, sure. I mean, there's, um, sure, I would be happy to. Jason, did you say Jason? That's right. Jason. Um, yes, so the Daily Decrypt was born in, I believe, October of 2015, when Pete and I were actually living in Mexico. Um, and I just want to throw a little thing in to, to anybody who maybe has considered before, like, what it would be like to be like uh, self-employed, right? Or like to start a little entrepreneurial venture the way we did. Um, we were greatly helped along in that by the fact that we had like such low living costs, right? I mean, living in Mexico, uh, we our cost of living was so much less than it had been in, we lived in New Hampshire prior to that. And so when you have less going out, you are more able to easily afford to like take the risk involved of employing yourself. Because in the beginning, you know, there, there's not steady pay a lot of the times. And, and you, you have to not only not make money, but spend money in the beginning a lot of the times. And so for anyone who who aspires to something like that, I, I would definitely encourage you to find a way to just cut your costs, whether that's like moving back in with your parents or just like downsizing to a sort of living situation that's, you know, maybe not ideal, but whatever, like for six months, for a year, if it means at the end you come out like self-employed, um, I, I do think it's worth it. Um, so back to the Daily Decrypt, that lasted about seven months. Um, it was great. Um, and it was through, you know, comparing all of these competitors in the digital currency space that I was like, man, like there seems to be like an ethos among some people, especially like in the journalism space, that like all blockchains are created equal and that they're all wonderful and they're all going to survive. And like none of us is going to lose our shirt by owning tokens on like a crap blockchain, which is obviously not the case. And as I said before, in response to the day trading question, I am in the space for like the long run, like for, for digital currency to actually be a sustainable thing that the average person can be empowered by rather than, because um, if it doesn't, if it doesn't become that, it is going to just have been a bubble, an embarrassing bubble on all of our parts. And so I wanted to not spend any more time talking about like every new blockchain that comes into the space as though it's like all equally worthy of attention because they're not. Um, and to me, the one most worthy of attention, the one displaying most promise was Dash. And so uh, I took like a couple months there after the Daily Decrypt stopped to be like, how can I work for Dash? And of course, like with the treasury system, it it eventually became obvious to me like, shoot, like, I could just do what I was doing, like what I, you know, am already good at. <laughs> and, you know, if they need me in Dash, then how fortuitous. So I put in a proposal to the Treasury to be paid to make a weekly YouTube show about Dash. And thankfully, they did want to employ me. And the rest is history. All right. Thanks for that answer. Good to hear. 
Um, Matthew, next question, asks, do you think your appreciation of cryptocurrencies could be enhanced by learning a programming language? But Matthew, Matthew, I, I don't know if I've ever said this like on any video, but um, probably like two, two and a half years ago, even before like I started writing like at Bitcoin Magazine and, and etc., I was just like looking at the state of things and I thought, if I don't learn to program, like the future will hold no place for me and I might go hungry in the most extreme of scenarios. And so I, I very much thought that I should learn to program because I envisioned a future in like 30 or 50 years when if you don't know how to program, you're going to be like begging in the streets or something, right? Um, and so I, I actually attempted several online teach yourself courses. Um, like like Treehouse and Learn Python the Hard Way and Code School and um, like this one book about like C++ and I tried all of them and um, I think it's just not for me because I would just like hit this plateau where progress and understanding just halted um, and I felt pretty bad about that each time. I felt like, I don't know, like a smoker, like trying to quit or something and just not being able to, like, was pretty down on myself, I'd say. Um, but fast forward to now, um, happily, it just so happens that most programmers are not very good at communicating to people. And most, or not most, actually maybe most, I don't know. I don't actually have the data to uh, say one way or the other, but certainly many programmers also have like zero understanding about economics. And so if I can communicate and if I can offer some economic analyses from time to time, well then actually there is a, a place for me um, within cryptocurrency and it's okay that programming worked out so poorly for me indeed the specialization of labor at its finest okay next question rusty asks do you conduct interviews from a schedule of talking points or are they all unexpected it depends um if it seems like the person who i have an interview scheduled with is like comfortable with just freewheeling back and forth stuff um I'll have in mind ahead of time, like some basic points that I personally would like to know about. But aside from that, I'll let it flow. And based on what they say, I'll ask any tangential questions that might come to mind. Um, but other people, in contrast, say, will you please send me all the questions you're going to ask me ahead of time? So, you know, I get the sense that these are more people who um, impromptu is not their thing, right? And I'm happy to do that because what's most important is that the interview subject be comfortable so that they can um, tell me everything that it is that they know so that they can speak their truth, right? And so whether they want to do impromptu style or they want to pretty much just know exactly what I'm going to say ahead of time, I'm happy to do either for them. Very nice. Very nice. Okay, next up, Kenny R. asks... If being a predictable store of value is part of what money is, why are cryptocurrencies so volatile? Uh, it would be nice if being a predictable store of value is what money is, but that's obviously not what money is, right? Uh, money currently, I guess, I mean, I guess one can predict that, relent that inflation will be relentless, right? Like as long as... <laughs> As, as money is like a system where you're totally like bound by geography and, and the people who have power to create money um, operate in a non-transparent way. Well, I mean, what you think money should be and what money is are just not one and the same, unfortunately. Um, in terms of thinking of like a store of value and money being different things, which probably currently they are, right? Like you have people saying, uh, like gold is my store of value. And then, you know, I keep some fiat to, to use as money. And that, of course, that paradigm has arisen because of the way money currently operates, you know, because inflation is so, um, opaque 
And because you never know, like, what these people are going to do, um, people don't feel that currency is a reliable, like, store of value because its supply continues to be diluted in an unpredictable and unstoppable way. Um, and so I think, you know, wouldn't the ideal scenario be, like, if your store of value and your, your, your me medium for exchange could be, like, one in the same? And I think, of course, that that is what a transparent blockchain-based digital currency offers. Because, you know, even if it has inflation, like, forever, as some of them do, like, at least if you know what that is going to be, there isn't going to be, like, this secret, you know, dilution throughout the monetary supply where you're like, I swear that last year bread cost, like, $2 and this year it cost $3. Is it because inflation or is it because of these other reasons I don't know? Um, but that said, my friend, um, blockchains are still run by people and people, as I mentioned in an earlier answer, are not going to change just because their technology changes. And so there is very much a potential and, and, you know, this, this is where we're going to go to the dark side of the moon a little bit here. There's very much a potential that even if a blockchain-based digital currency like Dash were to become widely used, as one of the other people said, like a reserve currency, if the people who are stakeholders and the owners of the infrastructure in that currency decide to, like, lift the cap or to, you know, or to do, like, inflation in unpredictable, in an unpredictable manner, all code-based still, mind you, I guess probably still open-sourced, but what I'm getting at is they could still do it. So if the majority of humanity wants relentless, unpredictable inflation, if that's really what the majority wants, and maybe they do, they can still have that with digital currency. And so... I would just say that, you know, if, if, you're, if you're in the minority and you want predictable inflation, uh, you know, hopefully there will always be a tool for you, right? Like, just because the majority is doing something, uh, if it's not something you like, hopefully there is always still a tool for you, as there probably will be. Like, with this, la with this last hundred years of fiat monies around the world just being, like, inflated into oblivion, there was still gold. People still kept their wealth intact through gold. And so if in a hundred years we are using a blockchain-based currency and its cap has been lifted and it's getting wild inflation too, well, then there will be something else for you to use that, that will allow you to keep your wealth intact. Basically, there's always a way. Where there's a will, there's a way. Okay, a bit more of a timely question from David H. who asks... What do you know about the warning regarding the Dash.io wallet app for iPhone? I assume it's not safe. Yeah, so it was, what, like three weeks ago that there was a post that somebody who nobody had heard of before, he was going with by the online handle Nash Knobs or Nash Knobly something, um, that he had, like, gotten a wallet through into the iOS store, and, and that's cool. Um, but what must always be kept in mind and what some like Dash core people pointed out is that something in the app store, like you can't see the source of it, right? Um, and that even goes for thing for apps, which are said to be open source. Like you don't actually know, as far as I can tell, you don't actually know that the app that you see in the Apple app store is actually that open source code base that you see hosted on GitHub. Um, and so, like, the Dash Core people reached out to Nash and said, hey, would you mind sharing with us your code base? Um, and again, maybe they were even just, like, trusting him a little bit there, right? Because, again, like I say, I don't think there's any way to verify the code base that an app in the App Store is running. But anyway, um, they, like, um, offered to, like, give him, like, a sort of bounty in exchange for like sharing his code base with them and he like took the money and then like stopped responding and so that was when the tweets started going out where people were like hey maybe this thing isn't trustworthy and they said that based you know primarily upon this person's behavior um as for 
As for how, how one can tell like what apps are and are not trustworthy if the source actually isn't viewable in these types of app stores, right? I mean, probably there will be other app stores invented in the future where you can verify the source. Um, but I mean, that's what like the number of downloads is for, right? And like reviews, I mean, it goes back to like a reputation based system. So long story short, is that app reliable? Like no one has any way of knowing. And so I, I really don't know one way or the other. I don't know if I would ever keep that much money in any mobile app, like if the source can't be verified, which they can't. Um, so yeah, if you use it, I would say definitely like don't keep that much money in it. And that goes for all mobile apps. All right, good advice. Next question from Tufi, who's wondering, regarding dash scalability, What's the maximum transactions per second? How many nodes and how many wallets? Currently? Well, currently, okay, so if we have like a one megabyte block size cap and if our, if our like data structure is similar to Bitcoins, then we have four times the amount of Bitcoins processing capacity, right? Because our block times are two and a half minutes, Bitcoins are 10. So it's widely circulated that Bitcoin can process roughly seven transactions per second. So seven times four is what, 28? So 28 transactions per second. Um, it is already on the roadmap, has already been voted upon to increase our block size cap from one to two megabytes. So 28 times two is what, 56? So it would be 56 transactions per second. Um, and that is like like current processing capacity, right? Um, as far as I can tell from the evolution specifications that have been published, um, that they will feature a sort of like, I mean, I guess I can only describe it as like lightning network esque, but in a way that's totally on chain, like doesn't, or rather doesn't require like special little hubs doing things that may be potentially unverifiable off chain. I'm not really sure. It keeps the same dash infrastructure completely intact, but is able to like uh, process some things and then like settle them back on the chain as often as is necessary, basically. You'd have to ask Evan more about that. Maybe he'll talk to me more about that in the future. I'm sure he will, or Andy Freer or whomever is working on it. Um, yeah, so long story short, in the near term future, we'll have eight times the processing capacity of Bitcoin. And in the long term future, um, much, much more than that. What was the, did I miss a part of that question? Was there something about nodes or something? Yeah, Tufi also was wondering how many nodes and wallets exist or maybe could exist. I'm not sure. Could exist. Well, an infinite number of nodes and wallets could exist. Um, Currently, there are like 4,500 full nodes, 4,100 of those being collateralized master nodes. And maybe you're asking how many wallets have been opened. And I don't, I don't know if that number is even knowable. Like, I think that only, um, on, only a wallet provider could give you just their own personal numbers. Like the way blockchain.info publishes, like how many wallets at blockchain.info have been opened um, to get an idea of how many Dash wallets have been opened, I guess you would have to actually find a way to calculate the number of downloads and or accounts through every wallet provider. And I, and I have no idea what that is. I'm sorry. All right, that's a good answer. Fair. Um, next up, new MZ asks, says, given that Dash has fairly obvious advantages over other cryptocurrencies in so many ways, why isn't it doing better? I see on coinmarketcap.com, for example, it's seventh. I think that we are up against, I think it's no more or less than first mover advantage. Um, in the earlier days, myself included, I thought that Bitcoin would be the one and the only forever. And not only that it would be, but that it should be. I used to talk shit about altcoins. I used to like think that they were just pieces of crap posers that were taking away from Bitcoin's market cap, right? Like taking away from our network effect and ruining our chances of seeing mass adoption. That, that used to be me. Um, and so if I like, 
a person who now works for Dash, like once held that mindset, imagine like how many other people just still do, right? And what's more, since so many people did hold that mindset earlier on, um, tons of investment was made into like Bitcoin specific stuff. And if there's one thing that a lot of people don't want to do, it's that they don't want to they don't want to admit that maybe their initial narrow business model is like not going to cut it right and that they're going to have to maybe, you know, incorporate other things and spend a bit of time and resources on doing that. But as Evan Duffield has geniusly pointed out, it is these people's need to or rather that they would have to spend some time and resources on incorporating Dash that actually gives Dash a totally different kind of first mover advantage, uh, which is basically our treasury system in that we can help to cover the costs of any sort of merchant or organization that is considering incorporating us, but they're like, hey, that costs us time and resources. We're not really so sure about that. So as Evan has pointed out, uh, whereas Bitcoin had the first mover advantage of just being first, right? And having like a lot of people think, you know, Bitcoin number one, now and forever. Uh, Dash now has the first mover advantage of being able to fund its own integrations, which I think as time goes, and, and as we're already seeing, makes it a lot more attractive to people when we're like, hey, not only can you expand your business model, but it will cost you nothing. <laughs> Pretty succinct. All right. Uh, next, we have a trio of questions from Phil L. So firstly, Phil asks, from a less technical person's perspective, is there anything that you think Dash could do better to increase adoption and make it more appealing to quote, normal everyday people. I think, I mean, yeah, the only, I, I wouldn't even f focus on reaching out to truly like normal everyday people until evolution is out because it's just, we don't have the product for them yet. We legitimately do not have a product to offer to the average person yet. And so that's why I focus for example, my work, Dash Detailed's content on people who are already willing and interested to look into this sort of stuff at its current low level of usability. Um, and so I would think, I mean, if you actually are lucky enough to like have average, like lay people in your life who are like, well, tell me about Dash. I'm first of all, like, wow, surprise. Yay for you. That's lucky. Um, I think the most that can be done or should be done before evolution comes out is um, like send him over to Dash school or something, right? Because I think that the more comfortable that the average person can become just with the concept of digital money, like with the concept that something that lives on the internet could be like completely transparent and completely accessible to everybody and something that we can feel good about holding our wealth in. I think that, you know, what, with that seed germinating a bit in the minds of anyone who cares, um, once evolution does come around and there is a product for these people to use, they will be m feel more comfortable trying it out. Yeah, seems true. All right, second question, second question from Phil is, how do you make sure you don't fall into confirmation bias and stay as impartial where possible so you don't so people don't see you solely as pro dash and anti other cryptos. Oh, that's a great question. Well, I I am consistently checking myself for confirmation bias based out of my own fear of being wrong. Like like ending up as a laughing stock, right? Like basically I'm so afraid of like ending up on the wrong side of history from having had a like a a, a confirmation bias. Um, that I, that I'm, I am constantly checking like Dash's fundamentals as compared to others and like Dash's trajectory as compared to others. Because if something else looks like it is better, like I am going to there, I will leave Dash, I will apply for a job in this other network and I will go to there because I most want to be on the right side of history in this digital currency stuff. 
Um, and, you know, and that's and that's based upon, you know, my own selfish like desire, like, you know, the, the, the primitive part of your brain that's like, don't get ostracized from the tribe or you will die out in the wilderness. Like that part of my brain, I would say, keeps me in check. All right. Well, hopefully you stay alive for a while. Uh, lastly, from Phil L. He asks, what have you seen from other cryptocurrencies that you like and think Dash could benefit from? Um, I think that the, like the, the, the marketing and like the, um, just the overall presentation that Ethereum has had from the start has been really nice. Like, like, uh, their intro videos on their YouTube channel and like that cool little diamond thing that they have and just like this general, oh, and like the, um, like the aura that they have at their like DevCon conferences. It just, it looks nice. Like it's a, it's a nice cohesive branding message of like coolness. And I very much think that uh, Dash could benefit from that. And I was so happy to see, in fact, a proposal put into the treasury last month by Ryan Taylor, Baby Giraffe, um, for hiring like a graphic design marketing firm to like redo Dash's logo and design the branding and interface that will be used on uh, evolution web pages, basically. And so I do think that we are heading more into the direction that Ethereum took right from the get go, which was employing like, you know, genius graphic design marketing people to to present the consumer facing product. OK, let's see where that goes. Yeah. Uh, next up from Pedro V, uh, he wonders, what about the Dash Treasury process and masternode voting do you think could be improved? Probably, um, so I've, I've heard a couple different suggestions. Uh, there's been talk of like the masternodes themselves electing a sort of like board. And it's like the board who votes on all of these proposals. Because as you may know, if you've um, seen any of these proposals, and especially on months where a lot of them come in, there, there can be like 20 proposals and some of them are like many pages long, like two or three pages long. And it's like, shoot, it, it, it almost gets to the point where it's like, are there masternodes not voting on this stuff just because like they don't, they don't have the time because it's almost like, almost like a full-time job to like, not that it is now, but if and when Dash gets bigger and even more proposals start coming in, which they will, um, how many hours is it going to take to review this stuff? Um, and so I've heard the idea of like masternodes electing a board that just does like votes on proposals full time. Bless me. I've also heard the idea this from Evan at one point of like having a sort of managerial system where there's like, okay, there's like one person who's like the head of uh, front end development, one person who's the end head of back end development, one person who's the head of like design, one person who's the head of marketing, et cetera, et cetera. And it is like those people elected by the master nodes, um, who then, who then execute projects below themselves, meaning the master nodes don't have to vote on all those individual projects that the managers undertake, but rather the master nodes just choose to keep paying that particular manager if they're doing a good job or to or to let them go and get someone else and maybe i just described like the same thing maybe this whole like board of governors thing versus like the managerial system is in fact the same thing now that i say it out loud it kind of sounds like it is um and so i do think that something like that may be needed down the line as dash gets bigger and our budget can afford to employ more people and fund more projects and they start coming in for it um and i do believe that that is somehow on the roadmap of at least some people in the core team um and it would probably be an improvement so yeah i mean if you have further questions about the the future of those plans i would i would direct them to someone um, on the core team who would no better than I. Okay. Next from MWBL. 
Does anyone live exclusively off Dash and how? I think a lot of people do. Um, I think a lot of people like were mining Dash or buying Dash, um, you know, back when it was like 25 cents, 50 cents, I don't know. But enough people were around in Dash's early days um, and accumulated enough of it through their efforts that they were able to launch like several master nodes, like 10, 20, 30 more. Um, and when you get into numbers that high, you you actually can live off master node payments. But those aren't the only people. I mean, uh, there. I think I think Evan said in the Q three report call the other day that the Dash network employs like. 20 people full-time or maybe less 10 or 20 people full-time and like over 100 people part-time uh and so yeah when you look at those treasury payouts to to the people who are getting paid dash yeah it's definitely enough for for some people to live on um pete and i live on dash so there's there's at least two people right there yeah was that the whole question did i answer the whole question yeah that was the whole question yeah and I think more people will be able to live off Dash in the future. That is certain. That would, that is certainly the goal, and that would certainly be ideal. Agreed. All right. Uh, and last questions come to us from Stephen J. So first, Stephen asks, "What are the cities that are hot spots in the world for Dash in terms of users and merchant acceptance?" Psh, I don't know. I mean, Salt Lake. I've been pretty surprised about like the the Dash representation in Salt Lake. Um, but other than that, I'm, I'm not really sure. Perhaps Austin, um, where the Bush family lives. Um, and I guess probably also Phoenix because like both Evan and Ryan live there. Um, but yeah, aside from those three, I'm not really sure. I'd be interested to hear where there may be more hot spots and maybe I should mention this now. Why not? I guess it can be cut if I come to regret it. But um, I've even thought about like maybe throwing a dash con, like the world's first dash con here in Salt Lake, like both because of the people I've met down here who I think would be willing to come. But also um, this area south of Salt Lake, people have started calling it like the Silicon Mountains or something like basically like a lot of tech people are moving into this area south of Salt Lake in Utah for whatever reason. And so um, I think that there is a potential that merchants in Utah will perhaps be interested in becoming like the early adopter merchants, right? Actually, Overstock, like the first mega corporation that ever started taking Bitcoin, Overstock is based in Utah. And so I think that um, if there is to be a DashCon, I will think more on that. Um, that Salt Lake City would be a really great place to host it. All right. And a bit of a follow-up to that first question, again, from Stephen Jay. He wonders, could there be a contest that would award Dash to the activist or organization that drives the greatest adoption of Dash in their city in terms of per capita merchant acceptance? Maybe he's asking us to do that. Um, of course there could be. Uh, anybody could put a proposal into the treasury to get the award money to then disperse to uh, whichever individual is able to get the most merchants accepting Dash. I mean, actually, a person named John Bush, again, the Austin, Texas guy, is actually getting paid to to try to get merchants to accept Dash right now. So this is definitely something that the master nodes have already shown their support for in the past. And so if that's something that you or someone you know would be interested in doing, um, I don't see why the master nodes would not continue showing support with Dash f to fund such an effort. Okay. And I actually responded to Stephen with a similar suggestion that he could spearhead a proposal oh. to do that. Yeah. Oh. Okay, and lastly from Stephen, when are the, quote, Bitcoin meetups going to finally start calling themselves cryptocurrency meetups or whatever's better? Some already are. And even if they don't change their name, they're, they're starting to become more open-minded. In fact, the, the, my first stop on the Decentralize All the Profits tour in Salt Lake City is at the Utah Bitcoin meetup. 
and they've they've like invited us they're willing to hear us out and so you know regardless of what they call themselves uh the general willingness to look to other solutions is something that is only increasing i think all right and that's all the questions i had thanks everyone for sending them in and thank you abj for answering them you're welcome and thank you too that's it for Dash Detailed this week. If you're anywhere near Minneapolis, Minnesota, I invite you to come out to our second stop on the Decentralize All the Profits Tour tonight uh, on Wednesday. The details for that are in the description below. And I also invite you, if you haven't yet done so, to subscribe to my weekly email that I send right to your inbox. It has, of course, the Wednesday video in it and any other important updates you may need to know about. You can easily do that by sending an email to amanda at dash.org with the word subscribe in the subject line. I'll take care of the rest. All right. See you next week.